All right, so let's get going here. Um, we talked a lot about electrons in atoms last week, and we're going to finish off that discussion by talking about what are called periodic trends. All right, these are going to be information that we can gain about elements relative to one another based on just where they live on the periodic table. All right, uh, one of which we've already covered here. So let's go over that one first. Electronegativity. All right, we introduced electronegativity in our Lewis structures discussion. All right, and electronegativity is this property of an element, and we can tell just how electronegative an element is based on where it lives on the periodic table. Uh, so let's just review real quick. What was electronegativity? This is an atom's ability to pull electron density in a covalent bond. All right, and we had this more like simplistic way to think about electronegativity. Atoms in a bond, they're engaged in this tug of war over that pair of electrons, right? So elements that are better at this tug of war, we call those more electronegative. So our electronegativity is this electron tug of war going on. All right, so if we look at our periodic table here, what is the most electronegative element up here? Everything all points to one element on this table here, and that is fluorine. Fluorine is the king of tug of war on our periodic table, right? The most electronegative element. And however close you are to fluorine tells you just how electronegative that element is. All right, so our periodic trend here would be from left to right. This is increasing electronegativity on our periodic table. Likewise, going from the bottom to the top of our periodic table. Again, everything pointing towards fluorine here is increasing electronegativity. So if I wanted to compare three elements, let's say we're going to pick calcium, oxygen, and silicon. And I want you to organize these from the least to the most electronegative based on where they live on this periodic table. All right, so we're going to rank these from least the most. All right, so we got to find where they live on our periodic table. Here's calcium, here's silicon, and here's oxygen. Which one is going to be the least electronegative? Calcium, the one all the way on the left hand side of our periodic table. And which one is going to be the most electronegative? Oxygen, fluorine's next door neighbor, also very electronegative. So that in the middle there would be silicon, right? So here is our ranking from least to most electronegative based on just where these elements live on our periodic table. All right, so we discussed electronegativity previously. We're going to introduce a few more of these periodic trends, these properties that we can uh, determine just by based on where an element lives on our periodic table. And we're going to play a very similar game here as we just did with electronegativity. All right, so our next one is what's called ionization energy. Okay, ionization energy. This is the energy required. to remove an electron. Okay, so we can create ions with our elements. 
right? If I go in there and remove an electron, how much energy do I have to put in to get that electron out of there? That's our ionization energy, all right? So we're specifically talking about removing an electron. Since electrons are negatively charged, if we remove an electron, that would leave us with a cation, with a positively charged ion here. All right, so we're going to be able to tell based on where something lives on the periodic table, but let's just think real quick. Let's take two elements. We'll pick sodium, one from the left-hand side of our periodic table. And then we'll switch all the way to the other side here, chlorine. All right, and let's just think. If we take sodium and remove an electron, that would give us the sodium ion. If we take chlorine and do the same thing, we remove an electron, that would give us this positively charged chlorine ion. Which one of these processes do we think is more favorable? Is it going to be easier to remove an electron from sodium or from chlorine? Which one of these elements likes to form ions with a positive charge? Sodium, right? Everything in this first column here likes to form ions with a plus one charge. We talked about why we removed those electrons last week, because it'll give us this noble gas electron configuration, right? So removing an electron from sodium is quite easy. It is very difficult to remove an electron from chlorine. Chlorine wants to gain electrons. It's not trying to get rid of them. It wants to accept an extra electron so it can become a negatively charged ion. So in general, it's much easier to remove electrons from our metals than from our nonmetals. So our periodic trend here of increasing ionization energy, increasing amount of energy that we have to put in to remove an electron, it increases across our periodic table from left to right. All right, and again, that's just because metals do not hold on to their electrons very tightly. They relieve, uh, they, what am I thinking? Give up those electrons so that they can form these positively charged cations. Our nonmetals hold on to their electrons very tightly. All right? The other trend is it's actually easier to remove an electron from the large elements down here than it is from our smaller elements up here. Larger elements, they don't hold their electrons as close to the center of that atom. Their electrons are just located uh, like spatially further away, right? The distance from that outermost electron to that nucleus is much farther for our large elements. So we increase ionization energy going up our periodic table. Okay, For electronegativity, we kind of excluded these noble gases here because they don't form bonds. But what about for ionization energy? Do we think it would be difficult or easy to remove an electron from, say, neon? What do we think? Who thinks it's going to be easy to remove an electron from neon? Who thinks it's going to be a pain in the butt to remove an electron from neon? Yeah, absolutely, right? Those noble gases are very happy with their number of electrons. They're definitely not trying to give any up. So we're going to include our noble gases in our periodic trend here. All right, so going from left to right and from the bottom to the top of our periodic table, we have increasing ionization energy. Our next periodic trend here is kind of the flip side, what's called electron affinity. This is the energy released when an atom accepts an electron. All right, so now we're not taking an electron away. Now we're adding an electron. So for example, if we took fluorine, and we added an electron in there to become the fluoride ion. This would release energy. We would call that the electron affinity of that element. Uh, what does affinity mean? Does anybody know? 
If you have an affinity for something, it means you love that thing, right? So we're talking about how much our elements really want electrons, how much they love electrons, all right? We're gonna again look at our periodic table and create this periodic trend here. And again, let's just take two examples from opposite sides. Let's again take our sodium and our chlorine but now we're not removing an electron. Now we're gonna add an electron in there, forming a negatively charged ion. So which one of these elements wants an electron more, sodium or chlorine? Chlorine, chlorine right? So our nonmetals are going to release more energy and our metals, they don't really want electrons. They won't release much energy at all. It's not, sodium's like, great, thanks so much for this additional electron that I didn't want, right? Chlorine, on the other hand, very much so wants that extra electron. That's what's gonna get chlorine to that noble gas uh, electron configuration. So much like we saw with electron affinity in terms of the amount of energy released, this is also going to increase as we go across our periodic table. All right, but unlike for ionization energy, there turns out not to be any sort of a top to bottom trend on our periodic table. It turns out that our small elements like nitrogen will release just as much energy when they accept an electron as our larger elements like arsenic. So there's just no periodic trend going from top to bottom here, only from left to right. Elements that live in the same column have about the same electron affinity. All right, so then the last one is what's called atomic radius. Which pretty much speaks to, for itself here. We're talking about the radius of an atom or the size of an atom. All right. So again, let's talk about our periodic trend for our atomic radius, okay? And let's pick two extremes here. Let's take our element with only one proton compared to an element with 55 protons here. Which one do we think is gonna be bigger, cesium or hydrogen? Cesium, right? So our top to bottom periodic trend is exactly what you would expect here. The more electrons, whoa, the more protons an element has, the larger that proton is. I'm sorry, the larger that atom is. All right. Now, if we apply that same sort of logic to say comparing carbon to fluorine, you would expect that the one with more protons would be the larger element. But actually, our left to right periodic trend is a little counterintuitive. Things actually increase in size going from right to left. This is increasing size or atomic radius. So it turns out that a lithium atom, for example, is actually larger than a fluorine atom. All right, we got this kind of counterintuitive trend in our periodic uh, in our periodic trends here, all right? So let's take an example and see if we can't think about why this is. Let's just take two elements that are pretty close to one another. We gotta pick ones in the same row here. Let's pick carbon and neon. And what we see from our periodic trend here is that neon's actually smaller than carbon, even though it has more protons, all right? So let's try to think about why that is here. Well, one of the things that we learned how to do last week is to do our electron configuration of these elements here. So based on where carbon lives on the periodic table, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Neon would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6.
All right, so now let's draw ourselves a rough sort of sketch of what a carbon atom would actually look like compared to what a fluorine atom would actually look, I'm sorry, a neon atom would actually look like. All right, so carbon. We're gonna draw our nucleus here. Carbon has six protons in that nucleus, All right? Neon, being a larger element, has 10, L I guess not physically larger, we just established it was smaller, but being an element with a larger atomic number, has 10 protons in its nucleus. But the nucleus itself is very, very tiny, right? So just because it has a few more protons in the nucleus, they're still about the same size. Most of the space of an atom, when we're talking about its atomic radius, is made up by those electron clouds that are on the outside of that nucleus, right? So most of the space in an atom is made up of the electrons. All right, so now let's put in our electrons here. Those 1s electrons are going to be at a lower energy level. That's a smaller atomic orbital than our other electrons here. So let's just go ahead and put these two electrons in that 1s. I'm going to represent as a small circle. Then we have our next energy level up, slightly larger circle for our 2s. Also two electrons in that orbital. And then we have that slightly higher energy p orbital. These are those peanut shapes, but just for the sake of not ugling this up too much, I'm going to draw it as a circle here and just show that it's a higher energy level by making it a bigger circle. And this has two electrons in it. All right. If I'm going to do the same thing for neon, it's also got a 1s2 and a 2s2. And now it's also got a 2p orbital. But that 2p orbital not, doesn't just have two electrons in it. Now it's got a total of six electrons in it, but the point is, is I'm still adding those electrons to that same orbital, that same 2p orbital, right? So I'm not adding a bigger orbital on there. I'm just adding more electrons to that same orbital. And because the number of protons has increased, the ability of those protons to pull those electrons towards it is that much greater. All right, so larger elements or elements with more protons. Got more protons, but the electrons are added to the same 2p orbital. Those protons can pull those 2p electrons closer, implying we have a smaller radius. So as we go across our periodic table, we're adding electrons to those same level orbital, those same principal quantum number. So our orbital size isn't getting any bigger but our nucleus contains more protons as we go across our periodic table. Those more protons have a better ability to pull those electrons in closer. So it turns out that the 2p shell of neon is a little bit smaller than the 2p shell of carbon because it's got more protons. It's got a better ability to pull those electrons in closer. If we then go down, as I go from neon to sodium, now I'm adding another orbital. Now I'm adding that larger 3s orbital, so that's why I see this jump in size going down the periodic table that we don't see going across the periodic table. All right, so again, our periodic trends here are a little bit uh, counterintuitive for atomic radius. Uh, intuitively, it does increase going down the periodic table. But counterintuitively, it will increase going from right to left on our periodic table. All right, so our metals are bigger than our nonmetals within the same row. 
All right, so now let's also talk about atomic radius of ions. All right. So cations, remember positively charged, cations are positive, right? These lose electrons. And our anions, they gain electrons. All right, so let's try to imagine what we think is going to happen to our atomic radius when we create an ion. Let's compare a lithium atom to a lithium ion. All right, based on where lithium lives on the periodic table, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. So if we want to just draw a lithium atom here, we got a nucleus that contains three protons. We have a small 1s orbital that contains two electrons. And then we have a slightly larger 2s orbital that contains just one electron. All right, now let's do the same thing for a lithium ion. What's the electron configuration for a lithium ion? Right, I need to remove an electron. What electron am I going to remove? That outermost one, the 2s electron, our highest energy in our electron configuration. So my electron configuration for the lithium ion is just 1s2. So if I take my lithium atom, my little sketch here, and I draw myself instead a lithium ion, I'm going to remove that outermost orbital. So what do we think? Is a lithium ion going to be bigger or smaller than a lithium atom? It's going to be smaller because I've removed that outermost, that biggest electron cloud. Not only that, and this is really going to uh, influence the size, now I have more protons in the middle than I have electrons on the outermost shell, right? So now I have an extra amount of positive charge in the middle. It can pull those electrons in even closer, right? So absolutely, our cations are going to be smaller than their atoms because they lose electrons. All right, if we want to do the same thing, but now let's look at an element that forms anions here. We'll look at fluorine. Fluorine has nine protons. It's electron configuration. I have a small 1s orbital with two electrons in it, followed by a slightly larger 2s orbital with two electrons in it. And then I got my 2p orbital. And that has a total of five electrons in it. All right, so now if I do my fluoride ion, my electron configuration for my fluoride ion, I'm not going to be removing any electrons. I'm going to be adding more electrons. Where am I going to add that extra electron? To which one of these orbitals? Our 2p, our outermost. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that noble gas electron configuration. 
So now if I take my fluoride ion, I'm adding electrons, but to that same 2p orbital. All right? Nonetheless, this one is going to be larger than my actual atom itself. Why might that be, even though I'm adding this electron to that same 2p orbital? Boom, exactly. My amount of positive charge in the middle of that atom did not change, right? I still just have those nine protons. But now I have an extra electron. So now this thing has more electrons than it does protons. It can't keep track of all those electrons, right? So its ability to pull those electrons in is weaker because it has less protons, or rather has fewer protons than it does electrons. Larger than our atom because we have fewer electrons than protons. So whereas cations are smaller than atoms, anions are larger than atoms. Okay, so these are our periodic trends, these properties that we can uh, say about an element just by looking at where they live on the periodic table. The first we had pr uh, covered previously, this idea of electronegativity, an atom's ability to pull electrons when it's in a covalent bond. All right, we also learned about ionization energy and electron affinity. Ionization energy is how much energy you have to put in to remove an electron. Electron affinity is kind of the flip side, the amount of energy that's released when an element gains an electron. And then lastly, our last periodic trend was the size of an atom, what we call the atomic radius. All right. Um, so now we're going to switch gears here and introduce our next topic. All right. And this is going to be comparing um, you know, this interaction between molecules, what we call an intramolecular force intermolecular force, I'm sorry. All right, so an intermolecular force is the interaction between neighboring molecules. So let's say, for example, we have a water bottle, a glass of water. We're talking about the interactions that are, will occur between neighboring water molecules. How are those neighboring water molecules interacting with one another? All right. There are different types of intermolecular forces that different molecules can exhibit. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those. And we're going to rank them from the weakest to the strongest. All right, and we're going to cover these one by one here. OK, the weakest type of intermolecular force is what's called a dispersion force. OK, so things to keep in mind about dispersion forces. These are the only intermolecular interactions that are available to nonpolar molecules. All molecules have dispersion forces, but for nonpolar molecules, these are the strongest type of intermolecular force, and they're the weakest of all of them, right? So nonpolar molecules do not interact very strongly with one another. That's why nonpolar molecules tend to be gases at room temperature compared to polar molecules. All right, so again, strongest that are available in nonpolar molecules. These arise from temporary fluctuations in electron density. So what the heck do I mean by that? 
All right. Let's take a look at a very simple system here. We're just going to take two atoms. All right. In the middle, we'll have our positively charged protons. And then we have our negatively charged electron clouds around the outside of our atoms. All right, these electron clouds here are filled with negatively charged electrons. So if I take two atoms and I put them next to each other, what type of interaction are those two negatively charged electron clouds going to have with one another? Are they going to be attracted to one another or repelled by one another? Do like charges, oh crap, do, yeah, like charges repel or attract? They repel one another, right? So these two electron clouds don't really want to be next to one another, okay? However, unless you're at absolute zero, there's always some motion of these electrons in those atoms, right? Everything's always kind of dancing around. So this electron cloud isn't static over these protons. It's kind of bouncing around. And every once in a while, there's a moment where the electron cloud moves away from one and you have this very temporary, very fleeting, attractive interaction between the protons of one atom and the electron clouds of its neighbor, right? So we have this very temporary, it's only gonna exist for a very short amount of time, but we have this fleeting dispersion interaction between the protons of one atom and the electrons of its neighbor. All right, so this happens with all molecules. It is a very weak, very fleeting interaction. It is our weakest of all of our intermolecular forces, what we call a dispersion interaction. All right, because it has to do with the interactions between the neighboring molecules, these dispersion interactions will increase depending on the size of a molecule. They're proportional to the surface area on a molecule. All right, so we can say increase with increasing molecular size. Bigger molecules will have more dispersion forces than smaller molecules. All right, so that is our very weakest. Next one up is what's called a dipole-dipole interaction. Dipole-dipole interactions can only occur between polar molecules. Only polar molecules have a dipole. All right, so let's look at a polar molecule, and we're going to try to imagine this intermolecular interaction, this dipole-dipole interaction. All right, so... Back when we were doing Lewis structures, we took a formula like CH2O, and we were able to translate that into a Lewis structure that looked like this. All right, and then we said that this is a polar molecule because it has this polar bond in it. And it's not a symmetric molecule, so you can draw this dipole moment. Um, in particular, which one of these elements is more electronegative, the carbon or the oxygen? Oxygen. 
right? So that means in this tug of war over these electrons, that oxygen is able to pull that electron density onto itself, taking it away from that carbon atom. So we represent that with that lowercase delta. This means we have a partial negative charge on that oxygen and a partial positive charge on our carbon. All right, so I'm going to represent the large amount of negative charge by coloring this electron in red. And I'm going to use the positive charge colored in blue on my carbon atom here. All right, These, this color scheme is pretty typical for representing electron densities in atoms. You'll see these electron density maps that have these hot spots that are represented in red, meaning there's a lot of electron density, or these cold spots represented in blue, meaning there's not a lot of electron density. All right, so we talked about these molecules. Given this formula here, we were able to draw this Lewis structure, and we were able to determine that this was a polar molecule here, right? We did that back when we were discussing our molecular structures. Now we're talking about the interactions between neighboring molecules. So I'm not looking at just one here, but I'm going to make a copy, and I'm talking about the interactions between these two molecules here. Right? So how are these two molecules going to talk to one another? How are they going to interact with one another? They're going to line themselves up such that, such that that partial negative end of the one is interacting with the partial positive end of its neighbor. Right? We said that this carbon, we colored it in blue here because it's left relatively electron deficient, doesn't have a lot of electrons, a partial positive charge. Our oxygen, we colored in red because it's got a lot of extra electrons, a partial negative charge. So how are these two molecules going to talk to one another? They're going to line themselves up in such a way that the negative end of one molecule can interact with the positive end of its neighboring molecule. And this is what we call a dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, so that is an interaction that we can have between polar molecules, all right, and again, it arises from the partial negative end of one molecule interacting with the partial positive end of its neighbor. All right, our next intermolecular interaction that we can have is what's called a hydrogen bonding interaction. All right, a hydrogen bond is just a special dipole-dipole interaction. It's just exactly like what we saw before. It's a dipole-dipole interaction, but it's so much stronger than all the other dipole-dipole interactions that we give it its own special little category we call hydrogen bonding. Okay? Hydrogen bonding you will see in polar molecules All right, but only in a certain subset of polar molecules. They have to contain one of these three special bonds here. They have to be either fluorine bound to hydrogen, oxygen bound to hydrogen, or nitrogen bound to hydrogen. Only those three bonds can experience uh, hydrogen bonding. All right, 
So if we want to picture a hydrogen bonding interaction here, All right, the quintessential example of a molecule that will, under, that will sort of engage in hydrogen bonding is water. Water has those oxygen-hydrogen bonds. Remember, you have to have one of those special bonds. All right, water will hydrogen bond with neighboring water molecules. And again, this is just a dipole-dipole interaction. So if we looked at this here, we would say, oh, we have a polar bond where our oxygen has a lot of partial negative charge, leaving our hydrogen relatively electron deficient. So just like we did before, we can color our electrons on our oxygen in red, and that lack of electrons on that hydrogen in blue. So then if we have two neighboring water molecules, what we're going to see is the partial positive end of one interacting strongly with that partial negative end of its neighbor. So again, just a dipole-dipole interaction, but it involves one of those special bonds, an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So this gets bumped up to that next level of stability here. This isn't just a dipole-dipole interaction. We call this a hydrogen bond or hydrogen bonding interaction. All right, and they're just that much stronger than our other dipole-dipole interactions. So the interaction between neighboring water molecules is quite a bit stronger than we see for these here. These are what are called formaldehyde molecules. Um, the interaction between water is that much stronger because it's one of those hydrogen bonding interactions. All right. And so then the last one here, our strongest intermolecular interaction is what's called a ion dipole interaction. So this is specific to ions and how they interact with other molecules. They can interact strongly with polar molecules. All right, so these are the interactions between ions and polar molecules. All right, remember we talked about how oxygen in a water molecule has that partial negative charge. Right, so that polar molecule where that negative charge is sitting on that oxygen atom. So what's gonna happen if I take, for example, a positively charged sodium ion and I put it into a solution? What we're gonna see is that the water molecules are gonna line themselves up such that those partial negative ends on that oxygen are going to be lined up next to that positive charge, right? So these waters will all orient themselves, sticking that oxygen out at that ion. Uh, these are that much stronger, because we're not talking about the interaction between partial charges, like we are when we're talking about dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. Now we're talking about a real deal ion. It has a full, -on, a full positive charge, in this case here for our sodium ion. Right? So these are that much stronger because it's not a partial positive, but a full positive charge. All right, so these are our four types of intermolecular interactions here. Importantly, the dispersion forces, these are the only type of interactions that you're going to see in nonpolar molecules. Polar molecules have the ability to dipole-dipole interact, or if they contain one of those three special bonds, they can even hydrogen bond, that next level up. Right? And then that very strongest type of intermolecular interaction is what we see for ions when they're interacting with polar molecules, right? These ion-dipole interactions. All 
All right, so let's just do an example real quick. I'm going to put down the Lewis structure of two molecules. And I want to know what are the strongest intermolecular forces available to these two molecules. All right, so first we need that polar, nonpolar skill that we learned in our Lewis structures chapter. CH4, what's called methane, would this be polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. All right, so first of all, carbon and hydrogen, basically the same electronegativity. Any molecule that only consists of carbons and hydrogens is classified as nonpolar. Not only that, but all four of these bonds are the same. So this is a perfectly symmetric molecule. So even if it was uh, a polar bond, we got that perfect symmetry in our molecule leading to a nonpolar. So then is this thing, what's the strongest intermolecular forces for a nonpolar molecule? Dispersion. Dispersion. All right, ammonia, NH3, this is polar. We got a lone pair on that central atom. All right, and not only that, but we have one of those three types of special bonds, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. So this one is going to be able to hydrogen bond. So these intermolecular interactions are really weak in methane. Methane is a gas at room temperature. But they're much stronger in ammonia, which is why ammonia is a liquid at room temperature. Right? Those interactions between neighboring molecules are that much stronger because ammonia can hydrogen bond with its neighbors, but all methane can do is have those weak dispersion forces with its neighbors. All right, cool. We'll pick up on this stuff next time.